Welcome, Scott Lash. Scott, when we prepared this um, conversation, we've been discussing many topics which could come up uh, tonight. You were mentioning that it could be really interesting to discuss urban farm. And uh, you've also said that the city and the census would be for you in relation to London and to the idea of the sort of portrait of a city be a quite urgent matter, taste, hearing, balance, orientation, smell, seeing, touching. So maybe it would be interesting to start with that sort of sense notion you wanted to bring up. I, I meant to bring those, that up with the other, the other interviewees. But, okay, uh, you, you can. You can. I later, thought it would be good to bring it up with later. you first yeah, yeah, to get yeah. the sort of... Uh, yeah, I mean, people, I mean, people talk about the city as, a, as a, a soundscape a lot, don't they? I mean, you know, groups like uh, Sonic Youth way in the past in uh, New York City we're trying to pick up urban sounds. So the whole idea of the city as a soundscape. Um, I mean, I think in, in that sort of context, you want to also look at, as, look, at, at, look at, at the city as a scape of gestures. You know, we're going to have Michael Clark and people later, you know, dance and gesture, but also visual, of course. I mean, the city and calligraphy, writing the city, there's a number of senses. Um, proprioception, balance. I mean, you know, you're stood there and kind of into architecture and you're balancing, but you're also doing that, I think, in, 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 in the city. You know, what, what sort of uh, confusion, disorientation, etc., will you have in the city? Um, what other senses are there? Touch, smell, smell. I mean, London, is it London that smells more like pigeons or is it Paris? I can't remember, but London has a smell. I mean, the Paris Metro has a smell. So, I mean, I think there's, <clears throat> I think the, the senses are really, really important in terms of uh, a sense of orientation in the city. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that, the, uh, on the other hand, we'll come back to this later maybe with some of the other interviewees. On the one hand, you've kind of got this idea of scape, you know, obviously from landscape or cityscape. But on the other hand, I think this is something that also relates to your work, Hans, and to Rems. Um, the idea of, uh, of experimentation, experimentation. So they're, they're kind of the metaphor, not metaphor, wrong word, metonymy or whatever else of uh, laboratory. Yeah, on the one hand, it's studio uh, on the other, and I think that's going to come up too. And can you maybe tell us more about that sort of idea of urban farm, which you wanted to bring into the discussion? <laughs> I don't remember this, but okay, fair enough. Um, wow, um, I thought you were going to ask me some personal questions, which I were, was, was ready to answer. Shall I ask you a personal question? Please, then, yeah. And then, then you can kind no, of think. Back to that later, think, that's perfect. Uh, yeah. uh, I have been kind of recent, very, very uh, impressed by a recent uh, development in your life. Uh, that kind of from a position of uh, academic uh, authority, you put yourself in a position <laughs> of weakness by going to China to learn Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to mm -hmm. maybe you to talk about that experience of uh, weakness, uh, but also yeah. what you hope to achieve by it <laughs> and, and what China is doing to you. That's interesting. I mean, I think, I think, I think it's important to... Um, China is disorienting me, but it's, it, 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 I think the, the, the thing about Chinese is not even, not so much the uh, disorientation, but kind of the new mode of kind of logic, really, uh, new mode of order on the chaos. Yeah? And I think a lot of the um, speakers, uh, speakers, interviewees later in the evening are, are, are thinking about various modes of putting order on the chaos, including kind of cosmology and all sorts of other things. And, uh, I think Chinese is a really different mode of putting order on the chaos, and it is, it is an order. Um, yet, um, yet in, in, in a lot of ways, China, uh, if, if you're looking at Guangzhou or Shenzhen or Shanghai, even Beijing is so kind of out of control, you know, like in our eyes, kind of chaotic. And I think that um, uh, there, I mean, Shanghai in, in specific, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, there are, are kind of what might be called mega cities. They have got, you know, the, 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 kind of, the, the kind of scale of immigration, the scale of disorientation is something the European city has never, never experienced. And my kind of London experience, which, which is a very strange double experience, I was here as a graduate student at the London School of Economics in the, starting in the mid-70s, like a, a century ago, and they came back at the end of the 90s after being away in places like Berlin, Paris, Sao Paulo, 
uh, China uh, for a number of years. And the extraordinary thing is that London has become that much more out of control. You know, like in 73, 75, you know, it was English people that lived in London, basically, with some minorities in. London, there was just no comparison to now, the kind of rate of migration in London is twice, 25 per thousand per year, twice the rate of New York's rate of migration. So the kind of, the, the kind of um, confusion and, and the, kind of, um, the kind of rapid kind of input from, from outside that, that we associate much more with places like Mumbai or, or, or Shanghai, you know, China, and, and, and Shenzhen or, or Guangzhou is something that's happening right here, I think, now. I don't think that's a very good answer, but... <laughs> but, yeah, yes, it's a very good answer, but uh, I'm more, more interested in, in the personal, you wanted a personal yeah. question. Yeah. How has the experience of putting yourself uh, in the position of somebody who learns something and somebody who doesn't uh, kind of yeah. e exercise authority but on, on the contrary undergoes authority, how, <laughs> how has that been at this age <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, transforming you, or has it? Um, well, I think and, it's and what do you hope to learn beyond learning to speak Chinese? Beyond to speak Chinese. Um, I want to talk to people in China. Uh, I'm really interested. I mean, the, if there are two things that's transformed London um, since between 1975 and 2006, on the one hand, it's the migration. And on the other, it's finance, it's mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. uh, because London, in between those times, has become, well, the financial capital of the world very, very much. And it's the money flows as much as anything else that has also set up the gross ine inequalities that weren't there 30 years ago in London, but are there now. Um, so in a funny way, I mean, and, and I'm doing work on financial markets in China. <laughs> mm -hmm. So kind of the London, ex uh, we're doing work on the construction of financial markets in China. So in a strange place, I'm, I'm kind of a, you probably know this, I'm kind of a sociolo sociologist of the future. I've always been a sociologist of the future, even though I'm now an old sociologist of the future. But um, the kind of stuff that was going on in London, I think, is going, in, in, in certain ways, is going on there now in terms, kind of, in terms of the kind of cutting edge of finance. But it's a different, it, it, it's a totally different setup. And I don't think I'm going to be in any kind of, position to understand it, and we're going to be doing a lot of work on that in the next three years, unless I've got Chinese. I want to get out to the localities and see what credit cards mean to people. I want to, I want to see how people relate to finance in a day-to-day -day way, and I want to understand how, um, how financial markets are transforming the space of Shanghai in particular. Mm -hmm. And to bring it back to London, uh, being a sociologist of the future, how do you see the future of London? I'm probably too optimistic. Um, that, that, uh, interestingly enough, that, that is something everybody says <laughs> this evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's probably why the three the of most, us... Yeah, the yeah, most yeah, sad the sentence. Most used, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the three of us have become friends over the years is because of our, our ridiculous optimism. <laughs> um, but nobody else is optimistic. Everybody else is pessimistic, and they're probably right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that... You know, quite rightly, I mean, you know, for artists and things like that, of course, London is becoming ridiculously overpriced. So, uh, be becoming ridiculously overpriced. That's the third factor, of course, the migration, yeah. finance, and then art. All f completely transformed in the last 30 years, and I'm sure others have said this already. But um, London is, is being completely overpriced. And I mean, the gross inequalities, um, you can only imagine getting worse. Um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, um, it, it seems like London, at least for me, I mean, the reason, me as an academic, uh, as, as a university academic, and as Rem calls an, uh, an authority, although I suppose you've got authorities in architecture mm -hmm. and art and all sorts of other places, as well as, um, as academic life, what I found completely different in London, and especially I'm a goldsmith, and so maybe goldsmith was a calling card here, um, is something I couldn't do in New York, and I couldn't do in LA, and I couldn't do elsewhere, and that's move over right into kind of working with people uh, in art, in architecture, in the general cultural sector. You know, and I think there, there's a certain kind of okay boundarylessness. That's boundarylessness that I think you have in New York very, very much. You can't cross those kind of boundaries in New York City. None of my friends at Columbia University or NYU are doing it. 
I don't think you can do it in, you know, Paris, which is so incredibly gridded, you can't do that there. I mean, I think there is that chance Shapeless. to do it here, you know, the shapelessness, the yeah. boundarylessness. Yeah. But that is, that's kind of almost saying that, okay, London is chaos and, you know, it will be chaos and uh, I thrive on chaos, but a lot of people don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about you as a writer. Uh, and, and there is kind of one particular uh, invention that I really uh, admire or enjoy without necessarily understanding it. <laughs> uh, I think it is in uh, Critique of Information where uh, as a counterpart to goods you introduce the word bads. Bad. Uh, and, and so I would like you to elaborate on that word bads. Because without yeah. entirely understanding it, I think there's a lot of bads uh, these days. I think that's right. I mean, I think that, um, you know, global, uh, it, it, it's in the context of kind of globalization. But maybe you know, first you should explain yeah, the concept yeah. of bads. What are bads? Um, <clears throat> you know, people talk about goods. You know, globalization is about the circulation and the movement of all sorts of goods, you know, like. Uh, cultural goods, economic goods, um, capital goods, consumption goods, service goods, uh, media goods, etc., etc. But what about the bads? <laughs> what about the bads? You know, what about, um, you know, which are sometimes, you know, some, obviously things like the environment, you know, pollution and things like that. There's also this incredible globalization of, of bads. And to a certain extent, the bads are the unintended consequences of the goods. You know, on the one hand, we've got this, um, amazingly productive and fantastic in a lot of ways finance sector here which on the one hand which is bloody good employs 250 or 300,000 people including you know another 150,000 outsourced jobs to Glasgow you know get on any flight to Glasgow any morning and it's just full of bankers isn't it you know on the other hand you know it, it's it's produced the kind of most the kind of unsustainable levels of inequality you know kind of uh, with the bonuses with uh, everything else that's going on with, um, you know, now with kind of pension funds being, being invested in hedge funds, being invested in kind of what are supposedly security markets, markets that are supposed to pump up security, you know, uh, I mean, are, are putting all sorts of, you know, all sorts of people at, at, at incredible risk in, in, in the worst possible way. So the, the, the other side of the goods is, is I'm afraid, bad. Yeah. You know? I want to be optimistic, you know. <laughs> Hans, you must have another question. Yeah, we have tons of questions. The question is just about uh, which question. Uh, which one? No, I mean before when we spoke about it, now sort of maybe it doesn't really fit, but maybe it does actually in terms of the bads. But we spoke a lot also in our trilogue, and we must say, I mean, sort of, you know, Ram was saying earlier, that it's almost difficult to sort of start to address questions to Zaha because you had, you know, known Zaha so well and it feels like a similar thing about this interview because we speak almost every week uh, with uh, you and, and Rem. So, I mean, one of the things which has come up a lot, which I think could be interesting to follow up here, is that sort of state of, you, you called it a permanent state of exception yeah, yeah. as opposed to rules, um, which obviously has to do with a kind of a Carl Schmitt moment and I think it could be really interesting to explore that here in relation to the okay. marathon about the city, about London and it's something which most definitely will tomorrow uh, play a role also in the conversation with Chantal Mouffe. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that, um, that London is clearly much less rule bound than the classical the classical modern city in advanced countries. You know, if you compare it to New York City, New York City is gridded. It's got a grid. Manhattan's got a grid. London hasn't got a grid. Paris is incredibly, um, incredibly structured. You know, P Paris entre mur, not outre mur. And we saw what happened, you know, outside of the walls of Paris. Outside of the walls of Paris is the banlieue. You know, outside of the walls of Paris is the riots. London isn't so clear. I mean, in London, you don't know where the walls are. In Paris, the walls are the peripherique, yeah? You go outside, and it's La Haine, you know, on the outside. In London, you don't know where the walls are. Is it the circular? Is it, you know, is, where, where's the inner city and where's the walls? I mean, in a certain way, in London, you know, it, it's, it's like in Paris and New York, the chaos is banished 
beyond the walls of the city. You know, the order of the center city, and here we're talking about urban form, right, Hans, you know, um, is banishing the chaos to the edges. London's got a lot of chaos right inside, you know. A lot of the chaos is right inside. We haven't got the walls, you know. It's a, it's a concoction of villages. And in that sort of sense, um, this sort of permanent state of exception, you know, and Carl Schmidt, you'll get this with Chantal uh, tomorrow in 9 a.m. or something, Chantal Mouffe. Now, Carl Schmidt, of course, was Adolf Hitler's favorite um, uh, political theorist, or at least of the Nazi party. And of course, his state of exception was uh, partly used to justify the Führer Prinzip, you know. And the Führer Prinzip was that, you know, because things are in a, a state of exception, you, you can no longer go on to the rules of parliament. Subsequently, of course, the state of exception has been understood in terms of invention. Well, you know, I'm afraid in London we got both sides of it. We have a wonderful state of ex exception, but not for everybody. You know, for a lot of people, okay, it's not a Fuhrer Prinzip, but it's a lot of suffering, and you know, people that can't, you know, the, people that are, that are, that are living on, on a level that's, you know, that's really unacceptable. But having said all that, no, I think that w what's really amazing in London is the way that, in a sense, the kind of chaos is taken inside the city walls instead of just being expelled outside. So that there's kind of a wonderful, but also horrible, at the same time, bad, you know, kind of, um, permanent state of exception here. One of the things I wanted to ask you also is, and, you know, Karl Schmidt brings us somehow to the past, and I was wondering, um, we've discussed in many of the interviews before sort of notions of dynamic memories, and I was somehow wondering who from the past are your toolboxes? Are there any kind of philosophers or sociologists whom you think for the current moment, in terms of the current moment, are, are toolboxes? These are really hard questions. Um, Dynamic memories, wow. Um, can you think of anybody? <laughs> you know? I mean, I was thinking of uh, getting back to your first question, which I've just kind of started to register a little bit, um, um, which, you know, the question of, of form or urban yeah. form a little bit. I, I mean, one, one person that who I would definitely recommend to everybody is, is Rems and, and you're, you're all of our friends, Sanford, Sanford Quinter, who wrote a, a wonderful book called uh, K W I N T E R who um, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Architectures of Time. Architectures of Time. And for Sanford, the city is kind of temporal. Yeah? It's not primarily, urban form should be understand temporally in a time sense and not just in a kind of space sense. Um, and, and I think that, um, I, I think that that's, you know, urban form, the, the city should be, should be seen as almost partly a self-generating form, but just as important, obviously, you know, for any kind of quasi-Darwinian, yeah, is what is the environment? What is London relating to as an environment? Clearly, it's global finance is one thing and a number of things, but I think the kind of London as urban form, you know, even though it's a kind of an out-of-control form, you know, what kind of form here is at stake? In terms of memory, London's a very strange place because, um, you know, all famously, you know, probably people have said this nine times already tonight, you know, you know, Walter Benjamin said that Paris, and, and I lived in Paris and Berlin before I came to London, you know, before I came to London properly in 98. Um, and uh, he said that Paris, you know, you had the ancient and the modern, you know, where Berlin was just the modern. It was cleaned out, cleaned up, you know. No, no ancient at all. But what about London? You know, people come from China, and the first thing they say about London is it's so old. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, they say it's so old. But in, in a weird way, the history does not inform it in the way that the history is always present, under the ground, informing everything in, in, in Paris. In a weird way, we act as if the history wasn't there in London, as if, as if it were some kind of, you know, kind of tabula rasa that, you know, came about in the 90s or late 80s or something like that. So, I mean, I think that um, on the one hand, the history's all there, you know, but on the other hand, the history's uh, not there at all. So thank you very much, uh, Scott Lesh. And actually, this is not the end of our uh, time with Scott Lesh because Scott is going to stay with us for the next six hours. Many thanks to Scott Lesh. Thank you. <laughs>